actually humbled by uh, being considered this uh, the first Dr. Nobunath innovation. Uh, as has already been said, Dr. Nobunath has this passion of doing things, and he is the one who has driven ACP and so many other organizations because of his love for academic activities and teaching. And I think what we have achieved uh, today, as far as ACP is concerned, of various other organizations, is predominantly because of his uh, uh, contribution to that. Therefore, it's truly humbling, and I know how much he's involved. We just had an excellent talk by him on the value of loving yourself and why it's important to really be happy and be proud of yourself. So I'm just going to be talking on briefly covering what India did as far as COVID was concerned and what the future lies. Uh, I'll give a broad overview of what we did as a country and then what we did at the All Institute of Medical Sciences, the vaccine story a little bit, and then the future. So we all know that COVID-19 is the biggest pandemic of a lifetime. We've never seen anything like this. And it started off with an outbreak which happened in Wuhan, in China, in December 2019. At that point in time, no one really anticipated the magnitude of the problem. And now, two years down the line, we have 265 million people worldwide who have been infected. And 5.2 million people have died. A huge number, still much less than what we've seen in previous pandemics, but still a worrying number. And India, we all know, has suffered from two devastating waves of this pandemic. And there's always this apprehension of another wave. If you look at data, India has a sec second highest number of documented cases in the world at 3.46 crores. And we have the third highest number of documented deaths. But if you look at it in terms of cases or deaths per million population, we are much lower down and we have actually done much better than many of the developed world in terms of cases or deaths per million population. So it's an important thing to keep in mind. The timeline that we have, 30th January 2020, first reported case of COVID-19 in India. This is three medical students who had come from uh, China to Kerala and they had taken multiple flights and there was this huge issue of contact tracing that one had to do from various uh, airports that they had been to. We had the first national lockdown on 25th of March 2020. Seems a long time ago, but not that long. S September 2020, we had a, the first wave. And then, of course, vaccines got rolled out remarkably well. We never imagined that we would be able to do it so early on 16th of January 2021. And we had two vaccines which were got emergency use authorization. May to March to May were bad months for us this year. We had this huge second wave, which was caused initially by the Alpha variant and then taken over by the Delta variant. And we had more than 4 lakh cases per day. And now, on the sec now this month, on the 2nd of December, we have the, the reports of the first Omicron variant, and we have now almost 23 uh, confirmed cases. So we had the first wave and the second wave. The second wave was huge, in not in terms of numbers, but in terms of the way it rose. The steepness of the second wave was what really hit the health infrastructure. Had it been as slow as the first wave was in terms of the rise, we probably would have done better. But it was so steep because the Delta variant was so infectious, it, spell, it spread so rapidly <clears throat> that it caused almost the entire family to get infected rather than just few people in a family. I, I had written this editorial in 2018, in March 2018, regarding pandemics. And I had said 100 years after the, pan after the flu pandemic of 1918, we are still very vulnerable and we need to prepare for pandemics. Because if you look at what has happened this century, in the last 20 years, there have been a large number of outbreaks. We've had H5N1, which is known as bird flu. We have SARS. We've had MERS coronavirus, which is still there in the Middle East. We've had Zika. We've had outbreaks of Ebola and others which have been there in different parts of the world. We've had one more pan previous pandemic, which was H1N1, also commonly known as swine flu. So enough indicators that there is something big going to happen, and we need to be ready for that. It's always... Uh, everyone feels that it's, it's not going to happen, but it's, it's always better to be prepared. So what were the strategies that we as a country adopted? Like I said, we had stringent lockdowns, we had physical distancing, we were very aggressive in what we call COVID-appropriate behavior, and there was widespread public education programs, many of us took part in that. There was alignment of political will and public participation. And we really ramped up our testing strategies, I'll come to that. Zero survey was done repeatedly, and this gave us more and more confidence that 
people are having milder infection and coming out of it, and therefore we are having some degree of immunity in the population. Drugs was made freely available. There was shortage of drugs. We had this whole issue of shortage of remdesivir, tocilizumab, and then of course empotericin. Health insurance was provided, and of course we had multiple vaccine trials, which are also complete. So we had proactive and unified response from the center and state. Remember, health is a state subject, and there has to be coordination between the center and the state. We had travel advisory as back as far back as 11th of January 2020. There were guidelines of how to send samples. Surveillance guidelines were put in place. Uh, there were on the 11th of March. There was visa suspension and compulsory screening was done, and the Prime Minister's Citizen Assistance and Relief in Emergency Situation Fund was also created. In April 2020, the cabinet approved a 15,000 crore package, which is known as the India COVID-19 Emergency Response and Health System Preparedness Package, which really helped in improving our infrastructure and, of course, improving our testing that we could do. So this key objectives of this package was to develop diagnostic, dedicated treatment facilities, and the whole concept of COVID, COVID care center, COVID hospital, COVID ICU started from there. Centralized procurement of a large number of essential equipment, and then there was a large uh, number of other activities like uh, building up laboratories, boosting surveillance. And on the 14th of March, they were able to uh, isolate the strain, which was uh, we were the fifth country to successfully obtain a cure sample of the virus. and i'll come to this also because we were involved in this from a handful of labs we have now more than 3000 labs and subsequently of course we had genomic uh, surveillance also done so on march 14 niv pune actually isolated the strain of the novel coronavirus this was very important because this helped us in two ways it helped us in developing some degree of our own indigenous kit as far as the rt pcr test was concerned and it also was one one was able to do a tech transfer of the virus to industry and this was to bharat biotech to make the inactivated whole viron vaccine so this helped in many ways and this i think a big boost as far as the country was concerned <clears throat> so i like i said we had very few labs and now in, in december 2021 we have more than 3000 labs which can do rt pcr testing we were involved aggressively in this and i'll come to that we are we have we are we have now a testing capacity of more than 2 lakh test 20 lakh tests a day and we touched 30 lakh also in the past uh, in uh, june july currently we are if you look at current data on a daily basis we are doing between around 11 to 13 lakh tests a day as per who guideline we should be doing at least 12 to 13 lakh tests a day so we are little below that in terms of our population but i think this is very important because as the cases come down testing should not come down because that will really help in being able to pick up a cluster or increasing number of cases in any area of the country vaccine was something which is again a story which i'll come to because this really helped and then there was of course the whole issue of getting ppe and equipment and again a lot of indigenous uh, production started happening and by may 2020 india began producing an average of 1 lakh 50000 ppe kits per day before this we were all importing ppes from china we were not making our own ppe and we had this whole issue in our own institute of ppe shortage n95 shortage and what will we do i think we really turned that around in a big manner and then of course there was infrastructure and training iec dashboard was maintained by the ministry of health and family welfare which looked at and this dashboard is still very active they have a war room also and there was a proactive role played by the media itself we also then this is one of the big boost that we had that was we were able to push forward for teleconsultation now it's not new the teleconsultation was something we were already working on uh, i was a member of the board of governors uh, of the mci and we had already made a draft but there was a lot of reluctance by the government to push this forward and there were a lot of medical legal issues covid 19 really pushed this very rapidly and the government released the telemedicine guidelines in march 2020 before this there was this whole issue of the legality of giving a teleconsultation because people said that it may be illegal and you may have you may be it may cause medical legal issues this actually allowed us to really do two things one is improve non covid care because during the lockdown lot of patients were not willing to come to the hospital or not able to come to the hospital with the teleconsultation we could reach out to them and provide care and it could be for hypertension it could be sugar control it could be for our copd patients where you just need to open. Uh, just a dose of their inhalers or start uh, maybe a short course of steroids or bronchodilators 
it also enabled us to start triaging patients with COVID-19 and home isolation became more popular and we could monitor patients more closely and provide treatment because of the teleconsultation that one could do. So I think this is a, has been a huge achievement and I think this is one thing that will move forward when we look at uh, how we can use technology to provide better care to patients in, in the periphery or in rural parts of our country. I'll quickly sh shift gears and tell you what we did as an institute. Most institutes did the same thing. We were a little bit more active because we were an academic institute and we had other mandates also. But I think the first issue that we realized was protection of healthcare workers. And that is why very aggressively from day one, we started holding, a we developed training modules, a hospital infection control team twice a day, three hour module in the morning, three hour module in the evening, uh, would teach all healthcare workers, and this was across the board of infection control practices. The other was motivation of healthcare workers. There was a lot of fear in the early days. Stigma was there. I, I still remember in the first few months trying to sort of uh, talk to a nursing officer. She had she felt she had come in close contact with the COVID-19 patient, and she told me the virus is all over my body. I can't go home. I'll my parents will get infected. It took a lot of counseling to really reassure her. Luckily, that patient turned out to be negative, but that was the type of panic, and you need to keep your healthcare workers motivated. And of course, there was a need to include infrastructure, training, mentoring, and generation of public awareness. So very quickly, we formed the COVID-19 task force. We, in the Institute, had multiple committees because we need to have a smooth chain of supply chain of diagnostics, of drugs, of human resources, and of course, looking at the other issues in terms of uh, how do we repurpose our uh, resources. I would have daily meetings with the entire staff, that is the faculty, the residents, our uh, nursing officers, our technicians, and other staff to, un to really look at the challenges that we had. And we had, every day there used to be a challenge, sometimes a shortage of PPEs. Once the residents said our PPEs are a poor, our N95 is a poor quality, uh, there, there is, it's leaking from the side, we need to change it. So we went and did another local purchase. One time one of our residents' uh, uh, wife uh, who was pregnant turned out to be positive. So overnight we had to make a COVID co uh, labor room. So those are the type of challenges that we had every day. And we did a little bit of work also on this. We, did a, we published a research paper of how you could recycle PPEs because there was a shortage of PPE at that point in time. How could you take PPEs, wash them, hang them, use a fogging machine and make sure that they are sterilized and then pack them and recycle them. We, that, we did that and we had a huge sort of uh, storage of almost 800 PPEs which we could, which we had recycled and kept. So a lot of things were done. First was infrastructure. We con converted our National Cancer Institute, uh, which is been inaugurated in 2019. It's a 700 bedded cancer hospital. It's uh, currently we were at 250 capacity. We opened it all up. The Vishran Sadam, which was basically a hostel at that point in time, was also converted into a COVID care center. A trauma center, which is 250 bedded, uh, 260 bedded, was also converted to a COVID hospital. And because of the lockdown, we were quickly able to move our trauma services to the main hospital and convert this trauma center into a, uh, in a, to a COVID hospital. Thereby, we created seven, more than 1,700 beds and subsequently more than 250 ICU beds. Challenge was not the infrastructure. The challenge was the human resources. You, you're not able to get more uh, residents. You're not able to get more faculty. You're not able to get more nurses. So you have to repurpose them. You have to motivate them. And there were times when we had people from anatomy, people from physiology being trained to manage patients and taking help of even undergraduate students. It was a challenging time. This is our National Cancer Institute, which is uh, uh, 700 bedded. You have a research block here, an academic section, an OPD, and an indoor ward. This is it from the ground uh, from the ground level. The building that you see on the left has, was inaugurated a few months ago. So this is an old picture by our prime minister. That is the Infosys with Vishram Sadam. Infosys donated money and made a Vishram Sadam, which is 800 bedded for the attendants of, and patients of cancer who are for chemotherapy or for daycare to stay in that center. This is the trauma center, which we also converted to a COVID hospital. And we started, like I said, use telemedicine for non-COVID patient care. And this is something that we did very, very aggressively. And of course, continue to manage 
non covid non covid care didn't go away it came down because of fear but there was a lot of non covid care which was required and i think one of the collateral damage of the pandemic has been the non covid patients who suffered a lot of cancers got to an advanced stage because it could not be diagnosed a lot of people had many various other exacerbation of the non communicable diseases we were not able to provide for we treated more than 20000 patients in our covid centers and these were all very sick patients i mean we were not really admitting mild patients and they just needed either high flow nasal cannula non invasive ventilation or invasive ventilation but i think the main issue was that we continued to train our staff we had all more than 50 web webinars online training modules and we have a subtle platform which we use for undergraduate training which is a module platform which is for training our undergraduate students uh, using uh, this uh, subtle platform this was also converted to uh, as mod uh, converted to train doctors interns and nurses and like i said almost 33000 of our employees were trained by our infection control team we also had these mentorship program which is our grand rounds were already mentioned by the chairperson uh, we also did a lot of other activities with the ministry of health uh to begin with we started enhancing the rt pcr testing this is a meeting i used to take once a week uh, we had 14 mentoring institutes and we would then divide various areas of the country and we then got after all the private and the government medical colleges to start an rt pcr lab in some colleges there was not that much of a push luckily at that time we, i i was still part of the board of governors so we got the mci to write a letter to them that the college would be be recognized unless they set up and invested in an rt pcr lab and this was it as you can see we had a dashboard of all the labs we got them all accredited uh, we got all of them had a quality check done and after that they were then given approval to start rt pcr testing we had an, uh, webinars this is the early part of the pandemic in 2020 where we had six webinars for management and site pre uh, preparedness we had over 3 lakh 85000 views and this was put up on the youtube platform currently it has almost 56000 subscribers we also did webinars for nurses and this was also done by the college of nursing and this also was very popular in terms of how, uh, educating about nursing care during covid 19 uh, then the obstetric care was also something that we were asked to do so 10 modules of educative webinar series from may to june of 2020 were done uh for management of these patients and this was also put up on the net and uh, was also very high uh, very well received the ministry of external affairs then asked us to do some webinars for the sark countries for, as part of international outreach program and so we did this uh, webinar for uh, sark countries which uh, where we got a lot of good response from maldives mauritius and nepal and we did these webinars on management infection control aids and lab tags i'll just run through my slides this is the national grand down that we started and this actually started because when i used to do e icus i realized a lot of people who were managing covid did not really have that much of background knowledge i still remember one person who was uh, from um, gujarat and he uh, converted his nursing home into a covid hospital and he told me you know i'm i'm an obstetrician i have been managing only patients with obstetric care in the past and now i'm admitting patients with covid and i have not much idea of how to manage them because i've never really managed anyone with respiratory failure and i i was really touched and i thought that showed the spirit of the medical profession that they were willing to take the pandemic head on and take this as a challenge and i i felt and i then realized that we must have some uh, case based discussion and that's what led to the national grand rounds which began in july 20 there was a lot of support from niti aayog and these were uh, really very popular the viewership was almost 3 lakh and we did that then subsequently with our international partners because at that point in time covid was actually causing more of a problem in other countries we had this outbreak in europe we had this in us and we want we were trying to learn from them how what are they doing so this was at the university college london where we had an outbreak we saw reached out to colleagues in new york also because new york also was having a huge outbreak at that point in time and their management strategies were what we try to understand then at the request of the ministry of health and family welfare we started an e icu program where we would react in interact with doctors in various covid hospitals and discuss about treatment and management issues and 
I myself have probably interacted with more than 500 hospitals across the country. And again, like I told you, I realized the diversity of treatment. One center was giving methylene blue as a treatment strategy, and they have said we are finding methylene blue to be very useful. The other uh, doctor argued with me that I think all patients should be given remdesivir on day one. If you have to decrease viral replication, why don't you give it to asymptomatic patients on day one? That will take care of the viral replication and patients will be all right. And then, of course, there were cocktails of drugs, of steroids, remdesivir, anticoagulants being all given on day one uh, because of a little bit of a panic reaction. So this really helped in trying to have a proper program in terms of the uh, management side. We also were asked by the Ministry to start centers of excellence in July 20, and this was a hub and spoke model. In phase one, we had state center of excellence, and then we had regional centers of excellence. Uh, this was the phase one that we did as a center of excellence uh, uh, supported by the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. And this had uh, over 1,25,000 viewers. And then in the second wave, we were again asked to start this program again, because this actually came down in January when we even thought COVID is over. And from April to May, we again had revived the regional center of excellence. We did 10 webinars, and these were recorded, edited, and there were presentations were shared. And we were keen that these centers then disseminated in their areas as far as the training program is concerned. In phase three, also, we interacted with the Indian Medical Association. And with IMA, we started another program of webinars, which could be given both to doctors in the government sector and the private sector. And this was converted to online model. At that point in time, we also focused on children because everyone said the third wave is going to hit children much more. There was a panic reaction, and the ministry said you must do webinars for children. So this was also done by the pediatrics department. And then we realized that we can also develop modules which people can go later on to uh, train themselves as far as COVID is concerned. So a four-module training program was de developed, which is basic of COVID care for physicians and healthcare work workers. This You could log on to this. You could do your modules, and you could answer the questions. And if you got your uh, answers right, you could print a certificate, which would say that you have gone through this training program. So this was a skill e-learning uh, sort of a training program, which was or not uh, like a webinar, but could be done by anyone by going on to the net. Coming to the vaccine challenge, I think this is another huge uh, story because <laughs> pandemic is a huge challenge. Distributing the, distributing the vaccine equitably to billions of people is also a challenge. And of course, there's the worry of immune escape mechanism and overcoming vaccine hesitancy. Now, when we look back, and I remember when we had the H1N1 pandemic in 2009 and 10, there was a huge issue that why is India not making this vaccine? We were manufacturing, but we were not doing research in vaccine. And at that time, for the monovalent H1N1 vaccine, we had to rely on donations from the WHO because we were not making our own vaccine. And I remember one girl died in Pune at that point in time, in 2009, and this created a huge uh, media uproar and there were multiple meetings in the ministry. But India was not at that time involved in man manufacturing uh, vaccines. The other big issue is to have a good platform for distribution. That is the challenge Africa is facing. Billions of doses of vaccine is now being donated to Africa after Omicron, but they're being given as Pfizer vaccine. Pfizer needs to be kept as minus 80. Africa doesn't have the capacity to distribute these vaccines. They don't have that infrastructure available, which we were able to develop to be able to reach out and distribute it even to remote areas, uh, maintaining the cold chain and having people trained to give the vaccine. This is something that we were able to do remarkably well. And in April 20, the NEGVAC was formed. April, uh, October 2020, we, there was uh, states were asked to uh, set up state level mechanisms for including cold chain. And then, of course, we had COVID Suraksha mission where money was given and the budget allocation of 35,000 crore was also allocated. The important thing here was that at that point in time, people were working on maintaining the cold chain. There were meetings being held that we will need so many extra syringes, so many extra needles. So the manufacturer was being asked to produce so many extra needles and syringes. And this was way back somewhere in September, October last year. So there was a lot of planning which went behind in trying to see that the vaccine rollout happened in a good manner. And I think it's remarkable. We have now vaccine of our own, Covishield, Covaxin, Sputnik has been approved, Johnson has been approved, and our own first 
uh, first in the world, a DNA plasma vaccine, Zycovy D, has also been uh, given emergency authorization. So India is in a much better position in R&D in vaccines than ever before. And from what we had initially that we were not being able to do it, we are now looking at so many platforms. Besides this, Novax is there, which Serum Institute is making. Biologically, with support from Department of Biotechnology, is making a protein antigen-based vaccine. An mRNA vaccine, which can be kept at 2 to 8 degrees centigrade, is being made by Genovia and is undergoing trials right Good now. Boy. And Bharat Biotech is looking at a nasal uh, vaccine. So we have a vaccine platform, which I think is remarkable for what we've done as far as vaccine is concerned. And of course, we have the whole issue of vaccine maitri that we are now giving vaccine to other parts of the world. This was stopped for some time during the second wave, but has again been started. Uh, this is a paper that we were involved in in the first phase, looked at the safety and immunogenicity of uh, the, the Bharat Biotech vaccine in a double-blind randomized phase one clinical trial. Uh, this is a subsequent phase three trial, which showed that this vaccine, uh, co vaccine has an efficacy of 77.8% and was uh, effective and well tolerated and without any safety concern. And we have now actually vaccinated or given doses to almost 1.2 or 1. Point, we have crossed 1.3, 1.3 billion people. This is a huge target. If someone had asked me or told me two years ago that we in, in less than one year, we will vaccinate <coughs> we or we'll give vaccine to or we'll give 1.3 billion vaccine shots in our country, I would have said it's impossible. And yet we've managed to do this in less than one year. So I think it's a remarkable feat that we've achieved, which is thanks to all our healthcare workers the vaccine program really did very, very well. And I think it also shows that developing a vaccine is only half of the work done. Delivering it equitably is the most important step, and this has been shown very well in what is happening in Africa. Unless we have equitable distribution of the vaccine, the pandemic will continue and new variants will continue to emerge. And there are Western countries which have almost six to seven doses of the vaccine pre-ordered per citizen. Whereas there are countries in Africa where the vaccine is even less than 5% as far as availability for the population is concerned. So vaccine equity is very, very important. We've had multiple strains. We've had the alpha, delta, beta, and, and the, de the delta strain also from India. And based on that, we had the development of what was known as the Infragog, which was started in January. Started off with 10 labs for genome sequences. Now it is more than 30 labs which are doing genome sequencing and building it up every day so that we are able to develop genome, uh, do more and more genome sequencing. And Infago actually was the one which reported the then what it was called the double mutant, which was the B1617, uh, and a variant belonging to this lineage, the B1617 too became what is known as the Delta variant, which is now becoming the dominant variant. Even now when we're talking of Omicron, we are seeing that more and more patients in Europe and in US are actually having infection with Delta and hospitalization is more with Delta rather than with Omicron. Uh, this is a paper which we had published during the second week and trying to look at the effectiveness of uh, vaccine du in during the second week and uh, second peak when the Delta strain was there. And this actually based on the study that we did in our hospital, the efficacy of the vaccine was around 50%. Coming finally to Omicron, a um, lot of concern about it. We've had more than 50 countries which have reported it. The concern being that this virus has so many mutations, more than 50 mutations, 30 at the spike protein region. But we still, whatever data we have, I think we is not sufficient to really come to any conclusion. It seems to be a mild infection, doesn't seem to uh, cause very high mortality, but is more infectious. But if you look at India, wherever we've had, we've had now almost 23 to 24 confirmed cases of Omicron, and one in a which could have been a super spreading event in a marriage party. We've not seen any surge in that area in terms of cases. So if you look at how things are in India, I think it's slightly different from what we're seeing in the Western world, but we need more data right now. And tweaking the vac vaccine is something that we can always do. And this is something that is possible. We do it every year for the influenza vaccine. Every year we have a new influenza strain. We have a quadrivalent influenza vaccine now. So it's always, possible to tweak vaccines to cover new strains. There's already a search going on to develop vac uh, uh, new vaccines to cover the Delta variant. There's also a company which is making a bivalent vaccine to cover the Delta and the Beta variant, because that is one which they feel could be more 
having an immune escape ph phenomena. So we will have new generation vaccine in the coming years. Finally, in the last few minutes, the way forward, can we have a third wave? I think this is a paper which was done by WHO, uh, the, by ICMR as part of the mathematical modeling. And there, they felt it was quite unlikely unless two things were there. You had a new variant, which was really more transmissible and at the same time capable of significant immune escape mechanism. Unless you had that, unlikely that you will have a significant third wave. And of course, for decrease in COVID appropriate behavior would also drive the third wave. And that is the other thing that we need to keep in mind. So combination of total lack of COVID appropriate behavior and the emergence of this new variant uh, is the only way that one could have a third uh, wave. Uh, so this is what I would already said that this could be the likely causes, a new variant which has escape mechanism and is more infectious. And to protect it again, COVID appropriate behavior, aggressive vaccination, and I think enhanced genome sur surveillance. We should not be caught off guard. We need to have more and more genome sequencing and limited lockdowns wherever a cluster develops a VC a surge in the number of cases in terms of positivity rate or hospitalization. Does this work? This is data from the influenza pandemic, and it showed that those cities in US which followed appropriate behavior with lockdown and social distancing, they actually had a lower mortality, and they were able to come back to manufacturing and employment faster than those which were more lenient. So it's a lesson that we should not forget that good aggressive uh, COVID appropriate behavior and limited lockdowns do help in the long run. Major challenges that we have are limited hospital beds, oxygen supply, and trained manpower. We need to really work aggressively on this, push for vaccination, and the gradual sense of complacency, which is actually coming in. And there is a little bit of COVID fatigue. We have to admit that. The government itself uh, gave another package, which was the Emergency Response and Health Preparedness Package Phase 2, which was given in July, 23,000 crore rupees, which is basically to look at various areas. It was to support more beds increase genome sequencing, develop a hospital management information system, even at a district hospital level, and focus a lot on teleconsultation. It also looked at pediatric units in all districts of our country and pediatric centers of excellence, 20,000 ICU beds, and of course, liquid oxygen and other supportive staff. So I think a lot of activity has been going on. But I would, what I'd like to say is that as the pandemic changes, we need to evolve and we need to really be ahead. So what we learned last year is, may not be relevant. Now we need to really see how things are and evolve accordingly. Therefore, to conclude, COVID-19 has caused considerable morbidity and mortality in our country over the last few years. We must not forget these lessons as we move forward in terms of preparedness, in terms of the importance of a robust health system. With the emergence of new variants, COVID-19 is here to stay and occurrence of further waves is possible. Another important thing to remember, COVID-19 is not going to disappear. It is going to become endemic. And we will have, like we have in influenza, cases which may come and go. We will have some people who will become very sick and go into the ICU as we see with influenza, with a viral pneumonia and having ARDS. But by and large, it will become endemic. India has responded by upgrading public health infrastructure, adopting telemedicine and investing in universal vaccination. But I think a lot more needs to be dealt in terms of public health infrastructure. And we need to see how we can push the frontier, frontiers as far as telemedicine is concerned. It could also be looking at things like EICs and other things. And we need to be prepared. We may not have a third wave, but that doesn't mean that we should not be prepared for any eventuality. Thank you very much.